so much. Thanks for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it, as we always do. I've been on the road now for, I'm going on, tw no, not 20 years, 15, 17 years on the road. So, um, so this is not my first event, but this is my first kind of um, uh, tech event like this, where it's all startups and stuff. We do, I do a live interview every day um, on my network, Tasty Trade, and we interview startups. We're basically a financial network. And once a day, we try to break up you know, eight straight hours of finance by talking with a young startup, old startup, we don't care who it is, just somebody with an interesting idea in Chicago to promote, um, to promote entrepreneurship. And I started as an entrepreneur 1980, 1981, before there was really the word entrepreneur. I mean, we were using, we kind of thought of ourselves as kind of, you know, cowboy, self-employed, the whole deal. So I've been doing this for a long time, but since we started Tasty Trade, um, we've interviewed 1,400 startups. So it's pretty cool. Like I've been, you know, and I'm interviewing people that are, you know, I'm 59, so, and I'm probably the oldest person in this room. But I've been interviewing people from, you know, basically my age all the way on down to 18 or 19 years old, talking about startups, talking about ideas, talking about kind of the Chicago scene. And, and this is my third company, and they're all, they were all startups, and, and I, I still love it, and I'm gonna do this, as I always say, till they you know, roll me out to the dumpster, that kind of thing. We, um, tonight I have a very short presentation. I usually, if you come to see us at any other point, we're, like I said, we're eight hours a day live on, uh, it's on, the, on the internet, and then we also do lots of live shows around the country and things like that. But, so if you're interested in finance, you'll wanna, you'll wanna look that up. But um, tonight I decided to do something, because it's short and only 20 minutes, just to talk about, you know, Scott asked me to talk about some of the successes and failures and, and everything else that we've had over the last, you know, 30 years or so, and some of the things that I've learned. Um, and, and I always find that interesting because I love telling the story because if we can, if I can give you guys a takeaway, I like to provide a takeaway every 15 minutes. And so today I got to provide a takeaway every three and a half minutes. So I get in the normal six or seven takeaways. So I'm going to try to provide a real simple takeaway every three and a half minutes. And then when we're done, if we have a couple minutes left over for a couple questions, you know, that would be, that'd be awesome. So again, my name is Tom Sosnoff. This is, my current company is Tasty Trade. This is my last company too, so I'm pretty excited about this. You know, you get to finish your career kind of how you started your career and do, you know, things that you love to do. Um, Tonight's subject, tonight's topic uh, was, and this is what Scott and the team had sent me via email, was, Tom, talk about, talk about crowds, talk about monetizing ideas. So I love doing that. But the problem is that I'm not so sure that anybody owns an idea. I learned this a long time ago, especially in, in business. You don't, everybody owns every idea. So let me give you an example. When I first started building Thinkorswim, which was a company before this, everywhere we went, we had to sign an NDA, some kind of uh, non-disclosure document, every, you know, um, just anything that, something that says that we couldn't take somebody else's idea. Well, just to show you how much the world's changed, and that used to drive me crazy because I never wanted to sign anything. But if you tried to walk into Apple or you wanted to walk into Facebook before you could even go in the front door, you had to click on a button that says, you know, it was basically this pre-filled out 25-page, you know, NDA. What I've learned over time is, and we don't sign those anymore, we don't use those anymore, nobody does, because everybody owns every idea. So then what differentiates? You know, the problem with most startups and the problem with most um, new inventors or creative people, everybody has great ideas, but there's not that much know-how out there and you're not able to differentiate, you know, why, why your idea and or your know-how is so special and then how are you going to monetize that over time? So one of the things I thought about here tonight is trying to, kind of trying to explain to you how over the last um, two decades, you know, we've monetized two businesses to the, to the extent of just a little over a billion dollars. And so, so it's like, you know, we've actually done this. And so I think it's important to tell the story because if you, again, if you can pick some stuff out of this, you know, there's, there's some really good takeaways. So again, I think the most important thing is differentiation through know-how, because your idea is not gonna turn somebody on, but your know-how is. It's like, what's inside your brain? What makes you so special? Why do you know this space better than somebody else? And that's what makes all that possible. So I'll give you a quick little um, 
Quick little background. I started off in, in Chicago with no money as a prop trader, just like every other kid that was 21 or 22 years old, and went to the trading floors because that was the land of misfits and that's where most of us fit in. And if we survived, that was cool. If we didn't, we went out and looked for a real job. And I lasted for 20 years on the exchange floors and built a, a, my own prop trading firm, of which we learned a lot about running your own business. It was just like running, it was just like running any other business as somebody that was self-employed. And this is way before degrees in, in entrepreneurship or anything like that. And over the years, you know, we tried lots of businesses. We tried investing in restaurants. We tried investing in oil wells. We tried investing in all different kinds. You name it, we tried it. What ultimately we found out over time is the one thing that people were willing to invest with us in was our own know-how. Well, one thing where people were willing to write a check to us was as soon as we said, okay, we're managing a little money. Okay, we're doing this. Okay, we're hiring this. People would leave really good jobs and come work for us. And we're like, wow, that's so weird. Why would anybody want to work for us? And we realized it's because we kind of knew our space better than anybody else, but we couldn't monetize that space being just traders and, and money managers and whatever, because it wasn't, wasn't really our thing to try to monetize something that we like to do individually. So we built a company called Thinkorswim. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Thinkorswim, but it was a startup in Chicago. We started in the summer of 1999, and it was um, myself, my, my, my trading partner, Scott, and then, um, and then we hired five other people. And not one of these five people knew anything about building a business because everybody had been self-employed before that. So, and they were all just traders. So we sat down and we just kind of sat around a table and we said, you know, what do you have to do to build a business? And, and you know, how do you build a technology business when you don't really know anything about technology? And your math skills are okay and blah, blah, blah. So, so we decided to build a business where we, we knew about derivatives. So we decided to build a derivative business. And, and everybody told us, you're never gonna raise money you can't build a business in Java because nobody uses Java because it's not fast enough. This, remember, this is 99. There's no developers around that can program in Java and nobody wants to trade options. And so, and then plus, nobody will ever give you money to a company named Thinkorswim. We're like, okay, well that sounds all reasonable. So as a pure contrarian, you know, we decided, all right, well that's a challenge right there, right? So, so we had spent, I had spent the prior 20 years, you know, building making money as a prop trader and building up whatever money I could accumulate over the years, which was in, in, in that time, you know, it was substantial as a trader, but not substantial in, in a bigger picture. And, and same with partners and everything like this. And so we just rolled the dice. We actually didn't tell anybody. We didn't, my daughter's here tonight, but we didn't tell, but um, at the time she was born, but she was only 10. So we didn't tell our wives, our families, or anything else that we were just about to spend every, all the money we'd made for the prior 20 years to build this company, which was a complete shot that everybody told us we were gonna fail at. Um, but you know what? You can't listen to anybody about anything. If you really believe in something and you think you have a know-how that's superior to everybody else out there, you go for it. So, and, and, and part of what I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes is, you know, is pressure and risk-taking and how important that is to the whole decision-making process and, whole, and how important that is to success. So we built this crazy company called Thinkorswim, and in, you know, and in less than, we did a couple of deals along the way, which were, you know, you, you took a lot of shots along the way. I'm not gonna get into any of the details, but you know, 10 years later, it was bought out for three quarters of a billion dollars, and we didn't even wanna sell it. It was hostile, almost hostile. We were a public company, and it was basically hostile. We lost control of our board, and so you know, sometimes things like that happen. But not, no, I'm, not upset, I'm not upset about it. We. <laughs> We bought a crazy, in the process of that, we kept a $10 domain name when we were eventually bought out. Um, we kept a $10 domain name called tastytrade.com because I liked that name and I always wanted to build a platform and I was really into building technology. But when we built Thinkorswim, we changed technology for online investors and we changed technology um, for people that were interested in, in, in our domain expertise, in our area of know-how. When we built Tasty Trade, we said, we said, you know what, we're gonna build a product now that we, again, we're going into a space that we know nothing about, which is media. Now, look at us. I mean, you know, people don't turn on, uh, turn on and say, wow, I'm just gonna watch this guy talk for the next eight hours a day. You know, this is not, this is not really, you know, who's gonna watch you guys? Just like, who's gonna trade on your platform? Who's gonna watch you guys? And so, so we said, okay, well, now we've got another challenge. Who's gonna watch us? And who's going to watch us with a crazy name like Tasty Trade? Well, um, so we started building this, I would call it an alternative digital network, but it's all focused on, 
alternative meaning it's alternative finance. It's basically quantitative finance. So just think about it. just I mean imagine sitting down and watching a show for eight hours a day on quantitative finance on the internet. Now we also we have 80 employees. So it wasn't like we built this little company up. I mean, we, we rolled the dice. We took the money that we made from Thinkorswim, which not all of it, but a nice chunk of it, and we rolled it into this thing. And you know, with investors that you know, once you're successful, people keep betting on you. And as long as you don't let them down, man, they just they keep betting, they keep betting, and they keep betting. Which is so important. Why you need to create models that work, and why it's so important that you need to you're, you're always proving yourself. But it's also important to always take money because then you can scale your growth and you can, it's kind of like an accelerant to growth. So we built Tasty Trade, which is now worth a lot of money, and it's the most, it's the most watched digital network in the world with 100,000 daily viewers, and people watch for two and a half hours a day on average. Just imagine, thanks, thanks. And, but, but just imagine somebody sitting in front of their computer watching a show with a couple of us on there talking about quantitative finance numbers and strategies for eight hours a day. I mean, it's just not, it's not normal, but we found something, we found something where our know-how actually got people excited about doing it. So what are my strengths personally? Well, because if you're going to build off your know-how and you're going to get people excited about what you do, and remember, People are only, you can only get, if you're excited about something and you're passionate about something, then other people get excited about it and they get passionate about it. And in a space where very few people are passionate about finance, can you think of something, an area of the world where, an area of business where there's less integrity and less excitement than the world of finance? So we picked that, obviously. We're pure contrarians at heart. So I'm a market junkie, which is good because no matter what business you're in, you better be a junkie for that business because otherwise people can see right through you, investors can see right through you, and whoever the creative people, whoever's backing you, whoever believes in you, like if people didn't believe in what Scott was doing here, okay, if he wasn't passionate, if he wasn't a junkie about what he's doing, nobody would ever buy one penny of what he was saying. Same thing for decision making. What I found through my, my business career, if you can't make quick decisions, and I'll get to how, how you learn how to make quick decisions in a few seconds, you have to be, be decisive and be able to make quick decisions. I think it's one of the keys to success and it's one of the strengths of business. You love doing business with decision makers. When I, um, two of the people on, uh, or one of our board members is the guys that started Groupon, the guys that run Light, Light Bank, Brad and Eric, who also did you know, Ideas Week and everything else. Those guys have obviously been ridiculously successful, but one of the neat things about those two that I didn't know is they can make a decision within five seconds. And I've been around people that do investing, I've been around people that do all kinds of business, and everybody's ability to make decisions, it's so rare to find somebody that can make a five second decision and they can do it, and so it doesn't surprise me for one second how successful they are because their ability to make decisions is incredible. But you need to be kind of, I call it a junkie, I don't know if that's a fair word, but, but you need to be excited about what you do and you need to be able to make decisions about what you do because if you have domain skill and if you're, and if you're an expert in your field and you're excited about your field and you can make quick decisions, you can put a certain value on goods and services that other people around you can't and it's the first person to every space and it's the first person to every decision that usually ends up as a winner. So what is, you know, ultimately, what is our skill set. Well, and, and what do we deliver that nobody else can? Why aren't people watching Bloomberg TV? Why aren't people watching CNBC, which are like direct competitors of ours? Why aren't people watching other things that have to do with, you know, with finance? Why is everybody tuning in to a crazy internet show in here in Chicago? And the answer is because we build goodwill. We appreciate our audience. We're not trying to instill fear in our audience. We're not trying to scare people by the stuff we're talking about. We talk about building opportunity and we talk, and we talk about it in such a way and we deliver it to our customers. We don't ask for anything. So we don't charge you, we don't ask for anything, we give you access to all of our archives. We build an incredible, an incredible amount of goodwill. Now, who are the most valuable customers in the world? They're financial service customers. They have a lifetime value. Average age in this room, I'm just guessing, probably, give me help, Scott. What do you, average age? I'm hoping it's 32, but my okay. intuition says Average age in this room, let's just say 30. Average age of a 30-year-old in financial service business, average value to, to a financial service firm over the next 30 years is about $350,000. 
If I start at 22, it's about a half a million dollars. If I start at 40, it's about a quarter of a million dollars. So you can interpolate in between. So, so if I'm able to create goodwill with anybody at any age, I'm able at some point to monetize that relationship. I don't have to monetize it right up front, but at least I have to know that it's worth something down the road. So we built a business that's never been done before. Think about financial media for a second, and all you do is see one shitty commercial after another shitty commercial after another shitty commercial from all these financial firms that you hate to start with. Okay, and it doesn't, and nothing works. But if you think about, if you think about goodwill, which is, you know what, we don't show any commercials. We said, you know what, the hell with commercials. We're not gonna show any commercials. We're not gonna put any advertising on our site. We're just gonna, we're gonna ask you to trust us that we're not gonna have any conflicts, we're not gonna sell out anywhere, and we're just gonna deliver you amazing content, and then when we ask you to do something, hopefully you'll do it at some point in the future. That's building goodwill, that's taking a huge shot, and that's totally betting on yourself. Most people that bet on themselves don't know what the results are gonna be because they don't have the confidence, they don't have the decision-making ability to really understand you know, the other end, the other side of the fence. I think we do, because we've done it for a while. We also do something that a lot of people are scared of doing, and this is a direct reflection on our years and years of trading, which is we take risk. Risk is good. Pressure, unbelievable. I heard Joe Madden the other day talking about pressure on like his team, on his pitchers and stuff, and he said, pressure's good. And I was like, damn it, finally somebody said that. Pressure's good. Risk is, risk is an incredible thing. It gives you a sense of, you know, ri risk means, you, as soon as you learn how to take risk, you'll take more and more and more. You'll be a junkie for taking risk. Because the first time you take risk and it works, you're like, wow, I didn't really do anything except what I would have done normally. And those who are scared of taking risk, it's very difficult to succeed with whatever business you create. Those who take risk, it's an incredibly powerful tool. It's like a drug. And as soon as you learn how to take risk, and that means, that means you don't do things when you're statistically disadvantaged. Risk is not making a bad bet. Risk is making a good bet and making a big bet when the pot odds are in your favor. And as you start to build businesses, you'll see this. You'll see certain businesses that are distressed. You'll see certain opportunities where the other side is distressed. And you'll take advantage of that because you're a risk taker and you're not scared of leverage or anything else. So my problem and the reason that we built Tasty Trade and Thinkorswim and the reason we were traders before that is because I have the easiest business to go after, passive investors. Because the world has been telling people that, or the world of finance has been telling people forever that they should just put their money into index funds and just leave it there. And in 50 years or 30 years or whatever, you know, next thing you know, you wake up, you're 50. Next thing you know, you wake up, you're 60. And you'll have a lot more money in the, in the bank or at the brokerage firm, wherever it is. And none of that's true. Your fees eat away most of the money, as you're starting to see now with all the transparency. And passive investing doesn't work. But it doesn't work just because the model's broken. It doesn't work because you don't learn anything. But nobody's ever told anybody that. And so as we built Tasty Trade, we're sitting there going, you know what? What's the message that we have to deliver? And the message is passive investing just stinks. For years, we've been telling people that with their money, they should be passive. But with everything else they do in life, they shouldn't be passive. Like, where do you, what business would you ever build when you're suggesting to your customers or to your partners or to your employees that everybody should be passive? Everybody should just sit back and accept a very low level of mediocrity. Just start thinking about that for a second. And then, and then you realize, so we found this space where we're thinking to ourselves, we love the space, we have the know-how, we've built the technology. Now we have to do is build the content, and the content only has to go after something which is really a piece of low-hanging fruit because it is passive investing. And what do you get when you're a passive investor? Nothing. What do you learn over time? Like this is why I always rant about robo-advisors and, and, and firms like you know, Robinhood and, and just junky brokerage firms and, and junky robo-advisors and horrible advisors everywhere else and banks that manage money and everything else. I mean, I, I rant about it because you learn absolutely nothing. So after 20 or 30 years as a passive investor, you walk away and you realize, one, I don't have any money. Two, I paid 40 or 50% of everything I have in fees over the years. And three, I didn't learn anything. So the bar set really low for us. So we just go out there and say, hey, you know what? Let's, let's get engaged. Let's learn something. Let's learn how to use these tools. The technology today is amazing. The content will blow you away. And what if it's all logical? What if it's all math-based? 
What if it all focuses on, on, on randomness and efficient market theory? We don't sit there and say, hey, this is going to go up because we did the research, or this is going to go down because we did the research, or this chart pattern looks like this. That's all bullshit. We understand that. We do everything based on just pure statistics. It's all based on volatility and fear and just other people's emotions. It's all based on pot odds and quantitative analysis and just pure probabilities. Do you know you can create predictable outcomes for yourself with your money? It's you know less than one-tenth of one percent of the people understand that. In, in the marketplace that we play in, in the game that we play, you can create whatever outcome you want. That doesn't mean you can make a billion dollars. That doesn't even mean you can make a hundred dollars. What it means is you can create whatever kind of statistical outcome you want. And when people learn that, they're challenged, just like a crossword puzzle, just like anything else. So it's a fascinating way to explore finance, and that's what we do. So my solution to the passive investing problem, or at least the passive investing issue the way I see it, is that challenge people intellectually. This is not hard. You challenge people, you challenge smart people intellectually with whatever product or idea you're bringing to marketplace or learning, or, or whatever product you're either investing in, bringing to marketplace, learning about, or you're excited about. You know what, if you're running, this, if you're running the company, challenge people. We've always been so scared. We've tried to scare people into thinking, hey, this thing's gonna blow up, this, you're gonna lose all your money, you're gonna do whatever it is, whatever business it is. If you eat this, you're gonna get this, whatever. Let's challenge people actually and make people use their brains. Let's challenge people intellectually because you know what? The, the, cons the global consumer responds to an intellectual challenge. You wanna build goodwill, you challenge people, you challenge people with something that where they have to use their brain. You challenge them where they need to connect the dots where there's a logic pattern. You challenge them where there's an equation that they can actually see. You challenge somebody with math. You challenge somebody with probabilities. You challenge somebody with statistics. You challenge somebody with creativity questions, but mostly it's all this ridiculous intellectual challenge that goes to take companies to the next level. When you look at companies out there that have succeeded, Okay, the, usually the person behind those companies or the creativity behind those companies or the idea is a massive intellectual challenge. Now sometimes it doesn't seem like that and sometimes, you know, some, for certain companies obviously it's obvious and for other companies it's kind of behind the scenes. But creating the intellectual challenge is really something special. And most companies have difficulty or most CEOs or visionaries have difficulty articulating and differentiating their challenge from everybody else in the industry. We used to have a rule, every product we built, if we're in the financial media business, we do not have cable in our office. So we don't even, you couldn't even watch one of our competitors if you wanted to in our office. Now they all watch everything we do because then they try to do it the next day. But we don't care what any of them do, anything, any, all the technology we've ever built, we've never even looked at another platform. Because we don't care what anybody else says, we don't care what anybody else does. I love the haters. The people that say, hey, your stuff stinks, hey, you know, your message is horrible, because it's all just part of, it all helps for PR, and it all helps just to, it all helps to get you excited, and it all helps that contrarian message. And as long as you've built, again, as long as you're basing everything on know-how, logic, on an intellectual challenge, and, as, and as, as long as you're delivering that with goodwill to people, you'll get responses. And very few people have this conversation. Everybody tries to tell you they have a great idea or they're solving a great problem. It's none of the above. What we're really doing right here is we're just challenging people and saying, hey, it's your money, it's your life, and you don't wanna wake up in 20 or 30 years and figure out that, you know what, you don't really know anything and now you've gotta go through this process about finances. So, so what's our secret? What's our secret message? What's our secret formula behind it all? It's that understanding fear is overpriced. And when you understand that fear is overpriced, you can see actually why people, why certain advertising works, certain marketing works, certain insurance stuff, certain banking things work. You can see why all that stuff happens because most, most people would prefer to be scared of something or fearful of something than challenge something opportunistically. So what you end up with is a situation where fear, just in general, is, becomes ridiculously overpriced. It's like, imagine fear is like the cost of insurance or anything else. In most cases, it's anywhere between 80% and 400% overpriced, which is what creates pot odds and everything else. So once you understand that fear is ridiculously expensive, you can build businesses 
around that logic, which means opportunity is created around other people's fear. It's very difficult to create opportunity without, on your own, just flat out on your own. It's easy to create opportunity when you see other people struggling with it. And so one of the things that I think that we do well and kind of the secret to our success behind the scenes is we do things that everybody else is scared to do. We say things that other people are scared to say. We build stuff that other people are scared to build. I mean, nobody thought that individual investors, like everybody sitting in this room or whatever else, would be willing to sit down and break down a Black-Scholes model. Or and nobody really thought somebody would be willing to take you know, a ridiculously hard advanced calculus problem and break it down. Yet, there's hundreds of thousands of people that want to do that. We have this theory on, you know, on complexity being free now, so the challenge of complexity is just, you know, it's, it's, it's exploding. And what we found is that people are smart. And if you kind of explain the cost of fear and how expensive it is, then people say, hey, you know what? I want to be on the other side of that. Why wouldn't you want to be? In most places, you can't be on the other side of fear because it's a one-way bet. You can't bet the other way. But in the world that, that I live in, in the financial world, all the markets are two-sided. All the markets are a penny wide. So you can live in the world of uh, efficient markets and you can trade fear on both sides of the market. So it's a big part of what we do and it kind of drives our business. So I kept that really short. Um, and and I, I usually, most of our sessions, I was telling Scott before, most of our sessions go for 90 minutes and or longer and and so if you ever want the the, the long form version of the, the interview or the discussion you should come out to one of um, one of the events that we do or <coughs> you can tune into the network or any of that kind of stuff if you've never seen the technology we built the thinkorswim platform is now owned by td ameritrade so you can check that out we have our own technology called dough and we also have um, um, tasty trade which is absolutely free and you should, you should enjoy it. And if you're interested in finance, or you're interested in being challenged, or you're interested in just having fun, or you're interested in seeing a really you know, smart entrepreneur every single day, like I said, we have had 1,400 entrepreneurs on there over time. I don't know how many have made it. I mean, I would say there's been, from the entrepreneurs that we've had on the show, there's been probably about $3 billion in exits. So that's pretty impressive. And there's probably been about $2 billion raised. So on the 1,400 different entrepreneurs we've had on the show. So there's definitely, you know, we give them, we give them a little a space, a little room to work, so it's fun. Um, I want to take a few questions, but listen, thank you so much for having me tonight. Appreciate it.